the National University of Colombia, Bogota, under the supervision of Thomas Dietrich. And then he finished his master's degree in 2000 with a work of non-random matrix theory spectral statistics in atomic chaotic systems. Now it was the so-called quantum chaos. And then in 2000, he moved to the Planck Institute for the Physics of Complex Systems in Dresden, Germany, <coughs> to work with Klaus Richter. Then he finished his PhD in 2004 in Regensburg, also Germany, uh, with a work on universal statistics properties of chaotic eigenstates. And then in, until 2006, he did a postdoc with Uzi Smilansky at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. And then from 2006 to 2007, he was assistant professor at the National University of Colombia. And then in 2008, he, he came back to Regensburg as a postdoc. And in 2014, he finished his habilitation or he got his habilitation <clears throat> on extending semi-classical methods a la Gutzwiller into interacting many body systems. Maybe most of you don't know that in Germany, if you want to become a professor, you have to do a, such a habilitation research after the PhD and after some postdoc. And then in 2017, was appointed to a permanent staff assistant professor in Regensburg. And in, since 2020, he is a aus professor. Ne? Uh, I, he told me the, the, the correct uh, translation is glorified assistant professor. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, so his main interest is in the application of asymptotic analysis of path integrals to connect classical chaos with its quantum many body signatures. So, Juan Diego, it's a pleasure to have you here. Please, it's your time. <laughs> Um, uh, thanks, Marcus. Thanks, uh, Thiago. I, I'm very honored by the invitation. Thanks a lot, uh, everyone, for being here. Um, before we start, I start. I have two two things to say. One is that um, I will be coughing my lungs all the time because I'm I'm a little bit ill. But I didn't want to miss this uh, this opportunity to um, uh, to present something to the colleagues in in Curitiba. And <clears throat> and who can say no to to Marcus, right? And um, the other is that I, I, I will very much prefer if you stop me anytime during the talk and ask any question that you that you have. Uh, I prefer if you try to follow instead of, of uh, I don't know, getting sleepy and, and asking some, some questions just at the end. So be my guest. Any question is uh, super welcome. Uh, you just interrupt me because I, I cannot see whether you have questions or raise your hand. Or, so, that's the deal. So now I will try to share my um, my presentation. Uh, it's okay. Can you see my presentation now? Someone yes. tell me. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> sorry. Um, the talk, the presentation today is about um, uh, scrambling as a manifestation of, of chaos and uh, criticality. And it's especially about the efforts of the last uh, years that we started in our group, undertaking in our, in our group, have undertaken in our group to relate uh, quantum mechanical scrambling with um, uh, semi-classical methods, or to understand, to provide a picture of a scrambling using semi-classical methods. So let's go to it. Okay, very important. <clears throat> this is work made uh, during the last uh, four or five years by a whole generation of very, very gifted uh, PhD students. Benny, who is now working in the industry here around Regensburg. Quirin, who is now postdoc on, in doing a postdoc in Liege. Matthias is the is uh, is uh, took care of the latest result. I will go, I, I will going to present on the out of time order correlators, and there is some other people along the way I, I will mention. Okay, let's go to it. <clears throat> the kind of 
intuitive picture of a scrambling you can get already in a system with few degrees of freedom, like a quantum billiard. So what I have here is what we call quantum billiard, meaning a domain in the plane given by this funny shape um, triangle, uh, where I simply solve the Stringer equation with Dirichlet boundary conditions at the boundaries. So this is a quantum mechanical system. I have one particle there. The classical mechanics is a particle bouncing, um, uh, doing specular reflections at the boundary. And what I'm showing you here is in... <coughs> Sorry. What I'm showing you here is the evolution of a wave packet, which is initially well localized around this spatial location with a well localized momentum toward the um, curve um, boundary you see here. And uh, what you see is that for very short times, okay, we have to specify later precisely what I mean by short and long and all that, but for, um, at the beginning, you can kind of see the, what will be the classical particle do, what would the classical particle do here? It goes, hit the boundary, gets reflected, and goes more or less in that direction. And there you see, effectively, the wave packet kind of hits the boundary and then moves away, along the way leaving that interference pattern characteristic of quantum mechanical uh, wave phenomena. <clears throat> but if you let the, 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 the time pass by, then probably in this uh, time equals two, you still can think that the particle is somehow localized around this corner. But when the time passes by, you see clearly that there is a, a point, a moment in time where uh, you cannot infer the classic, the position of the classical particle by the shape of the wave packet. You see, it's completely distributed. You don't see anything there. <coughs> this um, happens particularly fast in this system because this system turns out to be chaotic. And uh, so the idea is that the quantum mechanical is scrambling this uh, loss of, uh, you are not losing any information here because the quantum evolution is unitary. But if there is an apparent loss of uh, information about uh, localization properties of your system, like where the particle is. <clears throat> and turns out that this happens pretty quick in chaotic systems. In an integral system, it will take way, way longer for something like this to happen if it ever happens. But for a chaotic system, it happens pretty quick. So <clears throat> we... This is the, the intuitive idea that the scrambling can be understood as a manifestation of classical chaos, because classical chaos, one of the things that classical chaos um, does is to um, ergodically um, explore the available uh, classical phase space. So, so, so that's <coughs> a question. Please, in, please. in the integrable case, will you see the scrambling? Scrambling? Um, I will be a little bit there. For scrambling, you need um, this process uh, to be characterized by a, by an exponential law. Okay. So, okay. Uh, okay. And in, in integral systems, the the time of the time scales that you get around uh, characterize um, algebraic behavior, and that's that is the precise definition there. So, in chaotic systems, the scrambling happens exponentially fast, and uh, integral system it happens algebraically. And of course, thinking in terms of asymptotics, essentially this means that you don't have a scrambling in integral systems. And if you have, it's certainly not universal at all. It's, it's strongly dependent on the particular properties of the system. Okay. Does this answer your question? Yeah, yes. Okay, right. Right. okay. <clears throat> so um, back in the, in, the, in the 60s, Larkin and uh, Ovchinikov made this uh, idea uh, of course, it's quantum mechanics, you would like to make this idea precise. And that's the origin, uh, although many people don't know that the, the out of time order correlators, OTOX, are that old, uh, because they, they experienced a revival after a famous talk by Kitaev in 2015. And of course, the paper by Maldacena Schenker and Stanford uh, of uh, 2015 also. Uh, um, Larkin and Ochilikov, in a different context, superconductivity, they introduce this quantity. So what I have here are two operators, B and W. Uh, when I put a T, I mean the Heisenberg operator at time T corresponding to the Stranger operator of B. 
and you evaluate the commutator of these uh, two objects, and then takes the is a is a, is a definition. The modulus the square of this commutator is defined as the commutator times is adjoint. So it's an operator. So that's the definition of this modulus square. Mm. <laughs> we are in the, we we, we uh, they they call this out of time order correlator. Let's mention just shortly that it's called out of time order because when you expand all the operators here, you eventually find combinations between. Uh, operators at time zero and operators at time t, which are not ordered in the way we always order correlation functions. We always put zero on the right and then move to larger and larger times when we move to the to the left. But this is not the case uh, for this object. And this funny ordering of the operators is what uh, came with the name out of time order correlator. <clears throat> so after the revival of the interest on the out of time order correlator as an indicator of uh, quantum mechanical scrambling, the first uh, very, very clean numerical experiment was uh, presented in 2017. Um, and this was very, very clean. What was the, what the catch here? I would explain in a moment what is the figure, but the catch is that to know that there is a scrambling, you need to calculate this object and look at it at different values of the effective Planck constant in your system. So different systems can be, after scaling, can be, you can define an effective Planck constant. For example, in a billiard, the effective Planck constant is h bar divided by the typical momentum times the typical length of the billiard and stuff like that. So once you identify um, uh, an effective h bar, the um, the behavior of the of the auto will depend on the value of this effective uh, plan, plan constant. So to probe oh, well, this is really scrambling. You have to change the effective plan constant, and this is expensive. And in few systems, you can control it that that well. In particular, <coughs> this uh, beautiful paper of uh, Wilson and Galitsky. Uh, show calculations for the autoc in um, in what is called the kicket rotor. So this is a um, um, it's a mechanical system in which you have a pendulum that is periodically kicked. And um, uh, we don't need the details, but it can be transformed into a quantum mapping. And we have we can very very efficiently study numerically quantum mappings. So the system is characterized by this k parameter. <clears throat> it's a classical parameter, K, that rules the transition from integrability for low K to chaos with large K. So you have this classical K parameter, integrality to chaos. You have the effective plan constant. And I'm just showing you the result of the calculation of this auto for a couple of observables which are suitable for this kind of systems. What you see is that, uh, you know, well, it, it starts uh, small. Then you have a region of exponential increase in time of this uh, of, of the auto and then a region of saturation this thing is very very clear in the fully chaotic limit which is the black curve here and in the integrable regime where you don't see that you see something but uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, it's not universal whatever but when you increase the the, the chaos parameter you definitely see a regime of uh, exponential increase and this regime of exponential increase then is characterized by some uh, quantity. And if you demand the auto to look like uh, exponential in time with something in the exponent, you call this exponent the quantum Lyapunov exponent. This is terminology, just that, 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 that you know. Of course, it's called quantum Lyapunov exponent because in certain regime, so in this regime of what we call short times before the saturation, the lambda that you have here in the quantum Lyapunov exponent is precisely the classical Lyapunov exponent. Mm -hmm. And this comes from a very simple quasi-classical analysis of the auto do, using wigner moyal expansions. You will get the result in systems with a classical limit. So if the system has a classical limit and the classical limit is chaotic, it is characterized by a Lyapunov exponent or many, you take the largest, and the behavior of the auto for times before the saturation is uh, exponential. I will refer to this regime as the quasi-classical regime because can be explained quasi-classical. Now, things get more tricky because, as I mentioned, the saturation time 
depends on the classical Lyapunov of exponent, but depends logarithmically in h bar. So if you want to check whether you have a scrambling, you have to check this logarithmic dependence of the saturation time. And this is, of course, numerically expensive, and that's why it's hard to, to do in, in many instances where we don't have such a good control on the system. But in this case, it's very clean, you see. The region where you start seeing a saturation is here marked with these vertical lines, and it really corresponds nicely to this time scale, which is called the RMFS time. The RMFS time is the time where quantum mechanical evolution diverges from classical uh, evolution. So the region of saturation is quantum, requires, it, you, you won't capture it using quasi-classical method, you, use, you need to use um, quantum interference there. And then I will call this region more like semi-classical. Good. So remember this time scale is super important. The RMFS time is super important time scale for this business. So <clears throat> this um, this talk is about um, our understanding using semi-classical methods of autox. So it's about semi-classics. So I need to remind you what I mean by semi-classics uh, in the in this context. Okay, semi-classics is not classics. It's very important that you, you, you remember that during this talk. In the way I'm talking about semi-classical methods, we are using properties of the classical solutions or classical phase space to approximate quantum mechanical amplitudes, not probabilities. This means that we take fully into account the kinematics of Hilbert space, like superposition principle and all that. Um, the semi-classical approximation by definition works also beyond the breaking or RMFS time, because it accounts for um, uh, for interference phenomena. And <clears throat> what we love and like about semi-classical method is that they provide a way to relate quantum mechanical phenomena with classical notion of integrality of chaos, because quantum mechanically you don't have anything like integrality of chaos or, or chaos. It's a classical concept. So you want to talk about something like quantum chaos, you need a system which is classically chaotic and you need to do quantum mechanics on it. And the way to relate integrability in chaos is through a method that uses classical information to construct quantum mechanical objects, and that's semi-classics. <clears throat> Why I call the classical mean field? You will see because in the context of many particle systems, the classical limit is not h bar going to zero, but number of particles going to infinity, and this is the mean field uh, limit. So semi-classical methods are good. You can <coughs> you can uh, apply them. We did a, a regime which is called the semi-classical regime, where a typical action of the system is large compared with h bar. And uh, but I need you to remember that uh, this doesn't mean that semi-classical methods are perturbative in h bar. They are essentially non-perturbative. Uh, interference, quantum mechanical interference, is not a perturbative um, um, uh, property. If you want to learn everything about this, the book of Martin Gutwiller is still the classic and most beautiful presentation of the concepts and methods of, um, of chaos and semi-classical methods in quantum physics. Okay, so to get a little bit deeper into this issue of the semi-classical border and semi-classical regime and transition, what I have here is a kind of funny picture from the classic paper from Zurek where he depicts this boundary between the classical and the quantum world. In the quantum world, you have, of course, um, the Schrodinger cat, and things look fuzzy. But in the classical, uh, things look uh, sharp. Now, the semi-classical program um, can be understood in two ways. If I have one particle, but the typical action of this particle is large compared with h bar, then I can use the classical limit of one particle systems, meaning Hamiltonian mechanics of one particle, to calculate the quantities I need to do semi-classics. And then um, I will be able to do quantum mechanics in this border here. Then when you have only one particle, what happens is that when you have one particle and the typical action is very large compared with h bar, an infinitesimal amount of decoherence immediately will transform your quantum particle into a classical particle. Well, the thing is that we can do the same now in the opposite, in the, not in the opposite, in the perpendicular direction on this diagram, which is 
I can also think about semi-classics when the number of particles is large. In the same way as, as thinking about large actions in one particle systems in this region, I will keep the h bar fixed. Now h bar is a fixed parameter, and I let the number of particles go large. It can be shown rigorously that the classical limit you need to do semi-classics to obtain the, the information about the classical phase space, you need to do semi-classics. In this limit is the thermodynamic limit where your quantum field theory um, is studied in the mean field limit, and typically this means you are doing nonlinear waves. For example, the gross pitayevsky equation, now the standard classical limit of a quantum field theory in the limit of number of particles going to infinity. In single particle systems, we have this powerful method, the Guspiller van Blake propagator. I will explain in a moment to do semi classics. Of course, if we want to do semi classics for large number of particles, in particular Otox, we need to do the similar thing to do semi classics in this regime. And this we, we can do. Again, in this regime, an infinitesimal amount of the coherence will transform your quantum field theory in a classical, in general, nonlinear field theory. So the <clears throat> What is this transition that tricky? You need all these special Gutzfiller, whatever methods. It's because if you probe a quantum system at a certain action scale S, you could think that you can do that by probing the classical system of this action scale plus corrections in H bar, o, H bar of S. Why? Well, because H bar is a small parameter, right? In the same way, you could think that quantum systems with N particles look like classical plus corrections in 1 over N. This is true in many situations which are very, very important, but not always. For example, interference phenomena is characterized by the existence of amplitudes that have this form. Uh, there are oscillatory uh, functions in one over h bar, or oscillatory functions in the number of particles. This means that h bar going to zero on n going to infinity are essentially singular limits. And that's why you need a special machinery to deal with interference phenomena in this asymptotic region. An example of the fact that these effects are non-perturbative is the discreteness of the spectrum. The discreteness of the quantum mechanical spectrum is, a, is due to interference between oscillatory terms with actions in the exponent. And discreteness is not something that you can get perturbatively. The saturation of the autoc is non-perturbative, and the universality of uh, quantum chaos in the sense of random matrix theory spectral fluctuations is also an interfering phenomenon. Okay, <clears throat> so let's come back to our, our autoc. Now I'm thinking a many-body system, and um, autocs in many-body systems got very, very, got lots of attention because <clears throat> the issue of a scrambling in a many-body system is particularly attractive. You can think that you have one that a particle in a many body system spreads correlations with the rest of the particles as time passes by. And when you look at properties of this individual particle, uh, because you have these correlations going around and spreading the system, you will have things like equilibration or something like thermalization due to this spreading of correlations. And the way to characterize that, well, is the autoc. So autocs are extremely popular tools to diagnose, uh, or the tool, I would say, to diagnose scrambling in many body systems. OK, so to attack the question of autocs in many body systems, using semi-classics, we need certain properties. We need a well-defined classical limit. If I want to do semi-classics, I need a well-defined classical limit. I will be very happy if someone asks me at the end, what happens in system without classical limit, and I will be very happy to say I cannot do semi-classics there. So let's assume that we do have a classical mean field limit. Since I have a classical system there, I have a precise definition of classical chaos, and I know when the system is chaotic. This means in particular that <clears throat> if the system is chaotic, it means in particular that you have the classical mean field solutions are locally unstable. So you have something like a Lyapunov exponent, can be perfectly well defined in many body systems. <clears throat> and they are ergodic, meaning that in a time scale one over lambda, things tend to spread around. Watch it. This time scale is not there in first time. It's just the classical time it takes to spread around. They remember that the in first time comes with one over lambda times a log of h bar, hmm? a quantum mechanical scale. 
So uh, in many body systems, we can define a semi-classical regime, which is the regime of large particle number. This can be shown rigorously. And therefore, I'm expecting to have a notion of n phase time, which would be 1 over lambda log of n. And this is what it, you call it different names in different communities. Erin phase time is the traditional quantum chaos terminology, a scrambling time for the people doing quantum information in many body systems uh, approaches, uh, breaking time, uh, for example, in the black hole community, they call it breaking time, but it's, you, you can recognize it by the logarithmic dependence with the effective H bar. So under these uh, circumstances, what we expect is that there is a regime of times beyond the ergodic time, but before the Ehrenfest time, when we have an exponential behavior of the autoc. Because what? Because remember that exponential behavior of the autoc for a short time was due to the Lyapunov exponent, so to unstable classical dynamics. And for times larger than the Ehrenfest time, we should have this universal saturation, which is due to interference. So can we prove that this is actually the case at all? Yes, we, we, we can do that. But to prove that, we need, guess what? We need semi-classical methods in many body systems. So I will take you through very, very quick through the main concepts behind the story of semi-classics in many body systems. As I was mentioning, <coughs> the main tool we use to do semi-classics in single particle systems is called the Van Blake Goodspiller Propagator. And uh, so we need something like the Van Blake Goodspiller Propagator, but for many body systems when the number of particles goes to infinity. You remember, for single particle systems, the quantum mechanical wave equation, the Schrodinger equation, can be solved asymptotically when h bar goes to zero by using classical information. It's not doing classical mechanics. You have to calculate classical trajectories, calculate their actions, their stabilities, and plug it into some specific way in an asymptotic analysis of the path integral. So it's not simply doing classical mechanics. You need uh, more, but it's not simply doing classical solutions. You need more, but everything that you need is in the classical phase space. Now, with uh, Thomas Engel some years ago, we posed the same question. Now, starting with the quantum dynamics of quantum fields, considering the large no number of particle limit, and showing that the classical limit is a classical field equation, and we can follow the Goodspiller uh, approach. It takes uh, it, it takes some effort, but okay, we. This program can be accomplished, so I will just show you the, the, the results. This um, K object is a standard notation for the, uh, for the matrix elements of the time evolution operator, meaning the propagator. What I have here is a bose howard system, meaning a system of uh, bosons occupying uh, lattice, uh, lattice um, occupying site, lattice site. I start with a bunch of bosons in certain occupations here, and I want to know the quantum mechanical amplitude to end up with a different distribution of the bosons with the different occupations. This is the most basic quantum mechanical question you can ask in a, in a many body system of bosons. I have a distribution of bosons here. What is this distribution of bosons after the time has passed under some Hamiltonian describing the dynamics of the system? If you apply the machinery of semi-classic to this um, propagator in focus space, these are focus states, occupations, and initial and in final are focus states. They live in focus space. You will end up <coughs> <coughs> sorry. You will end up with an expression for this amplitude. It's not a probability, it's an amplitude, okay? That's important. That looks like this. It looks like a sum over gammas, which label solutions of the mean field equation, connecting certain in the initial occupations with the final occupations. So there are several of these solutions. They are characterized by some stability properties, which go into this amplitude A gamma, and they have actions that go into this phase R gamma. Now, it's Instructive to compare with the classic Van Blake Goodspiller propagator, which is indicated here, which is just the, the transition probability between position eigenstates in a standard single particle systems. There, the Van Blake propagator, instead of a path integral, is a sum over classical solutions, the action of the classical solution, and some stability prefactor. So it looks the same, 
but they live in very different spaces, of course. This is focus space, this is configuration space. It's a, sorry, this is focus space, this is the Hilbert space of quantum mechanics. Okay. Now, how to do that? I won't go into details, but I want to give you a flavor of the complications because it's a certain complications to carry on this. Why, if you were paying attention to what I say right now, I was talking about, I need to sum over all the classical solutions here in this sum. And if I, when I teach this to students, uh, many times they get uh, shock. Of course, they will tell me, Hey, Juan Diego, we learned in our lectures in classical mechanics that the solution of Hamilton's equations is unique. And they are right. The thing is that, as you can see, the classical problem implied by this construction is a classical problem in which I specify from some complex field, I specify the initial amplitude, the initial modulus, and the final modulus of the field not the initial modulus and the initial phases of the field. If you specify initial modulus and initial phases, you have an initial value problem with a unique solution. But if you specify initial and final moduli, you get, you may have, and typically for nonlinear system, you do have several solutions. And because you have several solutions, you have interference. So the fact that you have several solutions here is super important for the semi-classical problem. So to give you a hint of the visualization, what I have to do is solve the classical field equation with some classical field Hamiltonian here. For example, the gross pita equation could be this equation here, nonlinear equation for the field phi. I have to solve it under the condition that the initial modulus of the, of the, different, uh, on the different sides of this uh, complex field are given by the initial bosonic occupations specified by the initial focus state. And for the final, the same. And then I have to solve this equation on these boundary conditions. I will, in general, find several solutions. I have to compute their actions, their stabilities, plug everything here, and that's it. That's my uh, transition amplitude. So make no mistake, this is, this is a difficult thing to do. But everything that I say is well-defined, exists, and can be done. OK, just for... As a teaser, we can do it with fermions, but this is another story. OK. <clears throat> now, you can, of course, ask me, and this is a perfectly well-motivated question, where it, all this thing works, because it looks like a lot huh, that you have to do a lot. So I, I will show you an example, not of the OTOC, which is a four-point function, but of a two-point function. A two-point function, which is just the probability to start in certain occupation in focus space. This is my system. I have sites. On each side, I can put a number of bosons. And these numbers are indicated by these numbers here. So four bosons here, three there, three there, two there, blah, blah. So I put bosons here. I have a bose Howard Hamiltonian that uh, makes these bosons to jump around and to interact with each other. And then I ask, what is the probability to end up <clears throat> in another focus state? So, for example, this point here is the probability to um, start in this focus state and marking here with the vertical line and end up with this focus state. So I'm always starting here. I just be, it's just for presentation. Of course, you can do it anywhere you want. So these are my initial occupations, and I ask what is the probability, quantum mechanical probability, to end up there, and I get this value. There, and I get this value. But if I ask what is the probability to start in this focus state and come back to itself, I find an increasing by a factor of two. This is uh, an effect into what is called coherent backscattering in wave mechanics and in particle systems, but this happens now in focus space. And this happens because of interference and is predicted by the semi-classical uh, propagator. I won't go into details, but it, it works. So we have a two-point function where the whole machinery can be put to test and gives uh, super predictive and super precise results. So a two-point function works. What about our beloved out-of-time order correlator? So there are 
several ways you can think about the time order correlator. You can, uh, um, uh, the out of time order correlator, you can think about, remember as we defined it before, the expectation value with respect to some state of the commutator square of some suitable operators. You can also define it with respect to a thermal state, as I'm doing here. And I will pose the same question. The same question is, OK, what happens if I use the semi-classical propagator to describe this object? It's way more complicated because you have lots of time evolution operators there. You have lots of, of sums over classical mean field solutions. It's a, it's a long way, but what we <clears throat> what one can show is that for this many body system indeed you have a region of exponential increase up to the rmf time and then a saturation after the rmf time this can be shown rigorously using the semi classical propagator assuming that the classical dynamics is chaotic as i mentioned before you have four time evolution operators around here so you have four propagators so you have to start thinking about how to put together uh, pieces of four trajectories to do our semi-classical business. And uh, so it takes some thinking and it's technically a little bit complicated. But in fact, um, in this paper, we show that indeed the out of time of the correlator in many variosonic systems behave as expected. So I was able to show- Excuse this. me. Please, please. Um, what is the motivation to use the the Gibbs state over there. Uh, <coughs> uh, sorry, thanks for the question. Well, it it um, mm, let me see if I have here an equation that should clarify this. Wait a second, let me look for it. Uh, No problem. You you can come to this point. Uh, yeah, I think, if you um, if you wish, I can, I can tell you in um, in words right now. Okay. Is that, Thank you. <clears throat> is that um, the actual? Okay. The 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 2015 paper of Maldacena, Schenker, and Stanford that is called Abound on Chaos predicts that the quantum mechanical um, Lyapunov exponent meaning the, the um, coefficients of the time <coughs> that appear when this, <coughs> sorry, when the out of time order correlator is calculated, you expect it in the chaotic systems to behave exponentially. So they predict that the lambda that you get here, quantum mechanically, is bounded by the temperature. So that's why the temperature has to be somewhere here. The calculation that they did is for this uh, Gibbs uh, state. So it's very natural to think about the dependence of the Lyapunov exponent with the temperature in the context of what we call bounds on chaos. And uh, that's one of the, of the motivations. And uh, I hope this partially answered your question. Yeah, is it? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, so we know that in many body systems, then this happens, at least many body systems, bosonic with a classical limit that can be shown to be chaotic. So in, in, the, in the regime where I can do my semi-classics. So I won't go into details, but this kind of combination of trajectories appearing around in the, in the calculation gives as a result you, the, the, this sort of constellation of trajectories produces what is called the, um, the process, the short time regime of the out of time order correlator, which looks like this. Look, you have a classical phase space integral or a classical phase space. You have the classical Gibbs factor here and the Lyapunov exponent that in general depends on where you are. I mean, the Lyapunov exponent not always is uniform or almost never is uniform in the whole phase space. So in general, it depends on the phase space point where you are. And uh, but okay, if the Lyapunov exponent is roughly constant in phase space, this factor goes out. This factor is one, and you get the expected result, the exponential behavior, and uh, this one over n square produces this Ehrenfestein dependence in the exponent. So everything makes sense and works. We are happy. And um, this result, however, is valid only 
when the temperature is large. For low temp, I, I'm kind of treating the temperature quasi classically here. So quantum effects related with the temperature are not appearing there. And in particular, my main field dynamics is completely independent on the temperature. We know that to, to check uh, this more carefully, we need to go into the regime of low temperatures, and this will require a substantially different machinery. I will come to it at, at the end. So, um, I won't go into details on, on this, but um, <clears throat> there are some questions about autox that are, look very, very attractive, and you could think, let's try to address these questions using semi-classics. One is a conjecture by um, Guan Kitaev and Corinne Stanford and, uh, and, and others that the out of time of the correlator at given temperature is not only doesn't only have this dependence e to the two lambda t divided n square, which is the k equals two term here, but actually there is a systematic expansion in k equals two, four, six, etc. They call it the multi exponential. So if someone has an idea how to understand that behavior is super welcome. We haven't been able to do it, but uh, um, but we were able to think about this in the framework of critical systems, not chaotic. So, but this is kind of an open, very interesting question from my point of view. <clears throat> the other big question in the business of um, scrambling is the Maldacena bound, which says that certain regularized version of the out of time or the correlator has this the form, this form, some constant minus another constant, then the typical behavior exponential behavior, but now you have a dependence with the temperature, and it says that whatever you get here in the exponent is smaller or equal than 2 pi over beta. And this is what is called the bound of chaos on chaos of Maltasena, Schenker, and Stanford. It's a very, very interesting and, and complicated question, and has been checked for many systems without classical limit extensively. In particular, okay, uh, this bounded is saturated for black holes. So that's why you say that black holes are the fastest scrambling in, in nature. So there is a lot of super interesting issues around the temperature dependence of the Lyapunov exponent. So any idea how to think about that is most, uh, most welcome. So the thing is that these are very hard questions. And uh, <clears throat> to go into this question, we will need very delicate asymptotics. Remember that this is an H bar expansion. So I need control over higher orders in H bar here. It's difficult. And uh, we will need to find the dependence in tem on the temperature of the Lyapunov exponent, which uh, seems to be quite, quite challenging using semi-classics. All that boils down to we need a chaotic ground state. And actually, having a system with a chaotic ground state is not obvious at all. Chaos is a semi-classical concept, and semi-classics apply for H bar small, meaning for large energies meaning large temperature. So to talk about semi-classics for low temperature is already pushing the, 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 the methods a little bit uh, harder. <clears throat> so we made the, we and other people made the, the following observation. The, both the multi-exponential behavior and the bound of chaos are short time effects. So all this is supposed to happen be, before the Renfest time. And we know that um, before saturation, before Ehrenfest time, what appears in the autoc is the fact that the, that the solutions are unstable. So you need the solutions to diverge from each other, to, to show some instability, but you don't need full chaos. You only need local instability before the Ehrenfest time to capture these effects. So an idea would be, instead of having full many body uh, chaos, and uh, all the complications that come with it. Let's study systems for which you have local instability, but not chaos. And this turns out that happens all the time in statistical physics we call criticality. So we are going to study critical systems, which are integrable, not chaotic, but critical, and try to mimic short time chaos by criticality. And that's the program for the, for the rest of the talk. <coughs> And uh, you can ask me why. Well, I can tell you because semi-classic for integral systems is a super precise, extremely precise uh, methods we have there. Lots of control over everything. So that's that's the plan for the for the rest of the talk. 
I will introduce you with a system which is integrable, but displays criticality. And we are going to calculate autox around criticality in this system and check for these difficult questions about the bound and the multi-exponential there. So what is the system? It's, um, <clears throat> I, it's a very familiar system for many of us. It's the, what is called the, the Lieb-Linear model. You have a bunch of bosons in, the, in a circle. So you have periodic boundary conditions. This is the field uh, operator form of the, of the Hamiltonian. We don't need details here. That's the kinetic part. And this is the interaction between bosons. It's attractive. You have a minus here and ruled by some coupling alpha. It describes a gas of uh, bosons interacting with delta interactions. And very important, it's integrable. It's integral in a very precise sense. The classical limit of this system is integral in the, in the inverse scattering sense. Uh, so just believe me when I say this model is integral, as many of you know. So, but this is a continuum model. So it doesn't look like a bose hoar model or anything like that. So we need to discretize. If you discretize and truncate, it's not integral anymore. Except if you discretize in momentum and go down to a three mode approximation then it, the model is, is again integral to show you that i'm showing you here numerical results for the spectrum of the system the excitation spectrum uh, for 20 particles solving exactly the the model using a method um, this model admits a bt ansatz so you have to solve some algebraic equations to get the spectrum and i'm considering the continuum model all all the momenta are, are allowed so that's how the how the excitation spectra look like. Now I will decrease the number of the maximum momentum. Now it's one, so I have zero, one, and minus one momentum. And you see the feature that you see here that the energies go down and then bounce and go up. This is a signature of criticality. And it's still there when you go down to a three mode model. And it's integral. So I have what I need. I have criticality, as I promised, and I have integrability, and it's tractable using many body semi classics. Okay, I won't go into details how to do that. This is a little bit of an art, but for integral systems, we have something called torus quantization to semi classically quantize uh, integral systems. And um, I won't go into, into details. This is a methodology that you have to go and do carefully. And it's based on the following idea. After all is said and done, we can reduce this model to a model with only one degree of freedom. That's the classical phase space. It has a set, which is something like an occupation on the ground state variable, and the conjugate angle phi. So an occupation and an angle. And this is the Hamiltonian, depending on the occupation on the angle, the canonical variables. This is the phase space, and I'm plotting here the lines of, um, of fixed energy. So when I fix a value for the energy for the Hamiltonian, I get each of these lines. When I start increasing the interaction, this thing gets deformed. And eventually, at some point, you see more or less around uh, interaction equals to 1 bam, you get this object appearing here. This turns out to be uh, a separatrix in the classical phase space in the sense that the motion outside is unbounded in phi or, or it is rotational in phi, but a motion inside has both from certain initial uh, small phi to certain large phi. It's confined in the phi variable. And if you keep increasing this, uh, this guy, eventually you will have a bunch of, of um, lines of equal energy, a bunch of trajectories of the classical system that remain confined inside this separatrix region. This is very familiar for people doing dynamical system, the concept of separatrix and the concept of uh, liberation and rotational motion. And um, <clears throat> so it's just the classical phase space. To quantize this, uh, we use um, um, a version of the Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization rule that demands that the area under a quantized energy is an um, integer multiple of the h-bar effective of the system. This can be derived uh, formally. 
So what I'm showing you here is what happened with the ground state of the system for this value of the interaction. When you, this is the ground state, this is the first excited state. So you see there is a completely different um, topology in phase space associated with the ground state and with the first excited state. And this is a hallmark, this crossing of the separatrix when you put more and more levels is a signature of criticality. Now, that the method works and you get uh, the correct energies and the correct uh, critical values and all that, this can be shown. So we, we show numerically here that the excitation spectra, the dots are the exact calculation and the lines are the semi-classical prediction for 20 particles. So it works. You just, that's the main message here. We can semi-classically quantize this system very, very precisely. So since we can do that, we can study the, well, the critical features, which is what happens in this region of criticality. So I will focus now on the critical region that gets more and more sharp the larger the number of particles. And uh, well, the critical region is characterized by this very nearby, a little change of the system moved from vibration to libration. And this happens around this separatrix motion. This separatrix is always characterized by the existence of, uh, of hyperbolic fixed points around. And I hope you'll see where I'm going here. If you have a hyperbolic fixed point somewhere, you have exponential dynamics. And exponential dynamics looks like chaotic for short times. So you have to do and do some work to get that uh, right. I won't go into details to the, do the precise quantization around the separatrix. But here is our first very nice result, is that the energy levels around the separatrix have a separation between them, which is inverse logarithmically in the number of particles. So I hope you recognize there already something. Let's do it more precise. If I associate to the mean level spacing around the separatrix, the corresponding time scale, simply by h bar divided delta e, I will find a time scale which is precisely the Lyapunov of exponent of the fixed hyperbolic point and logarithmic in the number of particles. So we have formally identified something like an Ehrenfest time, but the system is not chaotic. The system is integral, but we formally identify an Ehrenfest time around criticality. Therefore, we expect that integral systems around criticality display scrambling because we have a Lyapunov exponent and we have a Ehrenfest time. So this idea that we can mimic short time chaos with local criticality is, uh, is, is uh, has been pointed out, I think, the first point where I saw it was in this uh, paper by Papalardi Elad, Elad on spin chains. There is also the Bose-Homer Bose dimer, the DK model. So it's a very appealing idea. We make it extremely precise using semi-classical quantization, but the physical idea, I hope, is, is intuitive uh, for you. Con okay, Diego. please tell me. Uh, just, just a question, but the lambda is smaller than one. Than one. It's not a problem. It's just the concept. It's the, the, the relation is equal. Because you, you see that it's integrable, the, 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 the Lyapunov exponent must be smaller than, uh, than zero, sorry. No, no. I, 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 thanks for asking this. This is absolutely true, except if you are at a hyperbolic fixed point. I mean, that's the point. Ah, it's okay, you calculate it analytically, exactly yes. on the point. Exactly. So it's very, okay, you okay. have to, to, to see it exactly there. But if okay. you do that, you will see an hyperbolic uh, behavior with positive lambda. But okay, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a, it's not a Lyapunov exponent. Of course, it's just a, okay. a, a, the stability exponent of a fixed point, which is hyperbolic. Okay. Thanks thank for you. asking. This, was, this is super important. So, do we have a scrambling at all after, I mean, I introduced this model, reduce the number of modes, uh, use semi-classical quantization. I, we have done a lot to, to, to justify that picture. Does it work? Well, it works. What I'm showing you here is the, the, tempera, the temporal, the time is the vertical line, behavior of the one-body um, uh, entropy the entropy of the one-body density matrix. You can define the one-body density matrix in the system, and you can look at the entropy of this, uh, of, this, of this object. And what you are going to find is that the entropy for initial times grow 
you see, this is the entropy for 10 particles, for 100, for 1000. And I just will put that threshold there and check how long it takes to, for the entropy to reach certain threshold, depending on the number of particles. And I see that the time it takes to reach that threshold grows logarithmically with the number of particles. So the intuition that uh, this, you are losing scrambled information in a time scale, which is not algebraic, but logarithmic in the number of particles, is, is, uh, is made explicit here in the, in, the, in the entropy. But of course, we want autox, right? So let's check out the time, the out of time over the correlator. I'm showing you here out of time over the correlator for different particle numbers. Uh, starting with this dark blue, which is 10 to the 6 particles, to this light blue, which is uh, 10 particles. First, let me focus on the detail here, which is the short time behavior. This time here is pretty large. Let's check the short time behavior. You see that when I increase the number of particles, the curves go and collapse into an exponential behavior. So this is the promise exponential behavior of the auto at criticality, because criticality mimics chaos in short times. So very happy with that. We have this characteristic scale, which turns out to be formally similar to the RMFS time given by the hyper by the um, positive uh, stability exponent of the fixed point associated with the critical transition. Everything works uh, there. But you see, for longer times, I get these oscillations. And that's that's weird. Of course, I'm say I don't know what happens with this system beyond the RFS type or be, beyond the formal RFS time because I cannot do the calculations uh, there. But uh, these are numerical calculations some showing that something is oscillating instead of saturating. We know that saturation is a phenomena that happens because of interference. So I need a theory with interference that goes beyond the RFS time to describe that. And, uh, but okay, this was tantalizing. Okay, wh why do we have oscillations there? Well, turns out, <coughs> turns out that since this system is not chaotic but integrable, it doesn't saturate because remember, saturation happens for chaotic systems. I was able to show it for chaotic systems. For integrable systems, you have this coexistence of short exponential behavior around criticality. If you don't have criticality, you don't see this neither. But if you have an integral system with critical behavior, then you have this initial exponential growth, and then integrability kicks in in the form of oscillations instead of saturation. And um, this can be then explained by a careful asymptotic analysis that shows this effective RFS time to be the unique time scale of any dynamic that happens in the system. So you have a unique time scale rule in any dynamics, you will have revivals on the scale of that scale. And that these are these revivals uh, here. So don't get scared. This is all this here is because the system is not chaotic but integral. We do have the exponential behavior around criticality. Okay, so now back to the, the big questions. I won't go into, into the multi-exponential. I will focus on then the bound of chaos, this open, super important question, uh, relevant in many, many contexts, and uh, <clears throat> whether I can use critical systems instead of chaotic systems to study the bound of on chaos. I'm showing you here numerics, and with this, um, this is the last set of slides. I'm showing you here numerics for the out of time of the correlator, define it as I defined it before. This is the time in units of the hopping of the bose hoar model. This is um, the out of time of the correlator. I have uh, 15 particles, a bose horror model of four sides, and the, this is the interaction parameter, some interaction parameter attractive. I'm plotting here the best uh, lambda, Lyapunov exponent, I get from the fitting of this region, which is where you expect to have exponential behavior. Um, the fitting here produce the lambda that is here in blue, and this 2 pi over beta curve is Maldacena's uh, uh, bound. So this is this system is not chaotic. This system is neither fully integrable, but I'm doing everything around criticality. So this is if you want to think about this system, don't think about the system as chaotic. Think about the system as critical. And then I will start changing the interaction, and you see that. Well, when I change the interaction, nothing really happens. 
the Lyapunov exponent really doesn't care much about the temperature and it's essentially constant. And therefore, well, in some regime, it will violate the bond, the bound. In some regime, it will fulfill the bound. Well, because it's constant. So this was very disappointed. You see, I shake my system. I go right now. I am right at criticality here. And nothing strange happens. The Lyapunov exponent really doesn't care about the temperature at all. So what's the catch? Why is this... Uh, not disappointing after all, because you have to go and check Maldacena's paper carefully. And Maldacena's paper do not talk about Gracias. 